So I'm walking one of the days that it was beautiful out this week, um, actually on the 4th of July. And I was, uh, I was, I was going uh, to see the parade, uh, one of the parades that was happening here and uh, ran into these two lovely women. Um, I think, I actually don't know, don't know your guys' ages, but I think, I think you're maybe a couple decades older than us because you've got kids um, just, you know, a little, little younger than us. Um, these women are wide awake. They're liberal and they are not buying the mainstream media nonsense. They are um, both vaccinated against COVID, both with J&J, &J, and uh, they have no intention of getting any boosters. Although in one of their cases, their son uh, said the reason that they got uh, injected the first time was that their son said, actually, Ma, you can't see your grandkids unless you get a vaccine. And so she uh, re very reluctantly went and got the one that she perceived to be the, the safest one, the J&J. &J. Um, and she wished, she wishes she hadn't had to. And so the conversation I then had, uh, you know, when she's telling me this is she says, uh, I'm kind of an anti-vaxxer from way back. And I raised my eyebrows at her. I'm like, really? Why? She says, well, I never took the flu vaccine, for instance. And I said, well, okay, but you know, the flu vaccine isn't really a vaccine. If, if you think about it, you know, if, if we're defining vaccine really liberally and these COVID vaccines are vaccines, the flu vaccine is vaccine, okay. But actually they're kind of cheating when they're calling these things vaccines. And, um, you know, anything with really rapidly fading efficacy such that you need shots within a year, you know, Canada saying nine months uh, is as actually JJ Cooey's insistence, and I think he's right, um, on calling them transfections rather than vaccines. Right. I have not heard him say that about flu. No, about the COVID vaccine. Oh, certainly, certainly. Yes. Yes. Yep. yes. Not, not about flu. Um, so I said, okay, so, you know, a lot of people are, have been skeptical about getting the, the flu vaccine. So I don't, I don't think that makes you an anti-vaxxer. And she said, okay. Um, so I was like, but you haven't gotten any vaccines? And she says, oh, I'm up to date on my tetanus shot. And she said, I got MMR. And when I travel, I always get the recommended vaccines like yellow fever. And I said, well, you're hardly an anti-vaxxer then. What you are is a trad-vaxxer, mm. a trad-vaxxer. And I'm also a trad-vaxxer. <laughs> I think you're also a trad-vaxxer. And trad here obviously has implications over in like trad-wife space. Trad-wife? Hell no. Neither of these women would abide by that name. I certainly don't. Hell no. Trad vaxxer, referring to what vaccines originally were, the mechanism by which they work, the reason that they are effective in getting your immune system to become aware of something in a small way, such that if they become uh, infected, if, if the body becomes exposed to the actual virus or whatever the pathogen is in a larger form, it has a head start on it. Yeah, absolutely. As we say in our book, Vaccines, along with antibiotics and surgery, are three are the three things in Western medicine that Western medicine has the most to be proud of. But that doesn't mean that anything you slap the label on, vaccine, is necessarily a vaccine. And so these trad vaxxer, that's that's what she she's not an anti vaxxer. It's a trad vaxxer. Yeah, I, I love the term trad vaxxer. I'm a little concerned that in, in, we're stuck in that it's not exact the line that one might draw if one had access to really good information on which vaccines are net valuable mm -hmm. i'm not sure that the line is and i'm not sure how far back it has to be traditional. oh and actually i mean this is something that i i wrote out but i'm not gonna go into here but but exactly right that uh there is no there is no line there's no time timeline before which and after which uh, every everything was pure or not, right? There, there was we we began to move away from by virtue of a new platform, new mechanisms of action. What uh, what the early vaccinologists were doing very quickly, and that doesn't mean that some of those advances weren't promising, but many right. of them were dangerous in ways that because they were incremental or because the public never was aware of them, uh, we we just accepted. So. I just want to introduce some of the necessary nuance here. Mm -hmm. One, just because something works by the traditional mechanism doesn't mean it's worth the risk, right? True. So you can have a cholera. 
process. Um, I, be- right. I believe you, you uh, already covered this one in, in a past week. Um, yeah, but, so- I, but I, I have not looked at it. I believe that cholera is a fairly traditional vaccine that is not worth taking. If you are a Westerner traveling into a place that has cholera, both because the efficacy of the cholera vaccine is known to be very low. And as a Westerner traveling, even in very remote places, you are very likely to have access to clean water, which is your best way to stay clear of, of cholera or to clear it from your system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, increasingly, I am alarmed by anything that uses killed virus or fractions of a killed virus because of the need for adjuvants. Right. So, although the killed virus yep. in principle might be in one way safer than an attenuated virus mm-hmm. because the killed virus can't evolve, um, yep. it is- The in- killed virus vaccines are less likely to infect you with the thing you're trying to get inoculated against. Well, killed virus vaccines can't really infect you. Right. Um, that, that, that counts as less. It's it's a lot less. Yes. Um, but the point is the body doesn't necessarily react to them the way it needs to in order to scale up the immunity mm-hmm. because it doesn't read them as a real infection. So it yep. is more likely to garbage collect them than to react to them mm-hmm. in, a, in a way that creates adaptive immunity. So- to beat that, they've introduced these things that annoy the immune system and make it seem sick so that it reacts as if it's infected, right? They create the, they create the artificial impression of something being uh, wrong mm-hmm. and they introduce this antigen and the two of those things come together and they generate a reaction, but who knows what else they generate a reaction to? Who knows how much autoimmunity, who knows how much food, food allergy or environmental allergy might be caused by that. So for my money, I'd say... Um, uh, attenuated vaccines are, despite the scary possibility, I mean, they do actually infect us. That's how they right. work. And There's um, obviously a risk. There's a risk with every single thing you put in your body. Well, there's a risk and there's also probably a cost. And I am not convinced that we know how big those costs are, that we measure them well. In fact, the more we learn about how work is done to see whether something is uh, worth the... Um, the hazard, the more I'm convinced that we don't have a system capable of even giving us good information. In this case, what is the distinction you're making between risk and cost Um, for the live attenuated vaccines? The risk is something that might happen to you, Mm -hmm. right? Like some pathology that might emerge. The cost might be if you're going to have an attenuated virus vaccine, it's going to infect a certain number of cells. Presumably, those cells are ultimately destroyed by the immune system. The immune system learns the formula in the process of destroying and discovering the antigens. You've lost some some cells. Hopefully, they're cells you can afford to lose, right? If they're in a tissue that you're not going to die of the failure of that tissue, then it could very well be worth it. If the disease itself isn't very serious, maybe it's not worth it. So 100% of the time, there is some cost. Right. Right. And uh, the vast majority of the time with effective, uh, successful live attenuated vaccines, that cost is relatively minor and the benefit far outweighs the cost. Right. It would be hoped. Mm -hmm. Um, The problem is because the people doing the testing are obviously uh, the people with a perverse incentive over discovering that, wouldn't you know it, these things are safe and hey, they're terrifically effective Mm -hmm. or no, terrifically efficacious. And we should actually get back to that distinction. Um, but in any case, the initial vaccine, right, uh, Jenner's discovery of the vaccine is effectively live attenuated, mm-hmm. right? Um, because what he used was, uh, or what he found was that cowpox had cross reactivity with smallpox. Yeah, no, that's it's actually perfect. So live attenuated to me sounds like um, something's been done to it to make it a little bit less virulent, but it's the sa- it's the same human pathogen. But if you've got a pathogen, a sister pathogen th- whose host is heterospecific, that is to say, a different species than humans, uh, that also has cross infectivity. That's perfect, right? And yeah. in fact, you know, basically what he noticed as the pox is was that uh, the milkmaids weren't getting smallpox because they were all downstream of cowpox, yeah. right? And so it was attenuated by nature yeah. and that led to the discovery and all of that. And it's a very elegant mechanism. Um, what to do with all the, you know, the, I do have a concern. JJ Cooey's point, and I'm increasingly convinced that although I dismissed the linguistic disti- distinction before, I think this is an error that I made. Mm-hmm. The transfection question is a serious one, mm-hmm. right? This is a um, to call this as a vaccine smuggles it in in a category that feels 
safer than it is actually, Mm -hmm. but it's way safer than some untested technology that um, does involve instead of producing the vaccine in a factory, turning you into a vaccine factory, right? That's what it does. And um, well, and, the, and so the linguistic smuggling, yeah. uh, it almost seems like even if we weren't actively set up, we were effectively actively set up for many, many years by understanding, you know, everyone in polite society is like, oh, we know that the anti-vaxxers is just a different group, yeah. right? And so what that creates is an understanding that for, for I believe, the vast majority of us before COVID would have said, yes, pro-vaccine. But would I accept anything called a vaccine if what it actually was was an experimental medical treatment that didn't have um, the data behind it that we were being told and whose uh, creators uh, had perverse financial incentives that went deeper than we can ever imagine? Most people would have said, well, just because you put that label on it doesn't mean that I'm going to take it. Right. right? And so th- th- this one word, and there are a few of these, but the word vaccine has such cachet. Has yep. such cachet for people um, that it has been that you know even even now we've got the state of Washington, the governor of the state of Washington, the prime minister of Canada saying actually no, all y'all's need to be vaccinated and boosted and all of this even in the face of increasingly overwhelming evidence that these you know, these are not the vaccines you were told they were. Right, these aren't vaccines at all. Right. Um, they're transfections. I do. Th- I don't know. Um, but I don't see any reason why the flu vaccine isn't a vaccine. I think it's just a lousy one. Um, so maybe there's something I don't know about it. But I, th- I think that's I think it is a vaccine by the mechanistic definition. It's just not uh, effective enough to be worthwhile and has costs that we don't acknowledge. Um, so I have one other point. It had to do with the dna back the dna transfection uh mechanism but i can't remember what it was anyway um nonetheless there is something to the idea that were you to say you know oh james is anti-pharmaceutical he's anti-pill mm-hmm. right that wouldn't make any sense because presumably James, whatever his conditions might be, should be anti just about every pill and only accept those for which there's evidence that it would be more beneficial to him than costly, right? right? And in fact, we recognize in the case of every single uh, pharmaceutical pill um, that there is toxicity mm-hmm. to it. And so built into the model is there's a cost and it needs to exceed that cost right. uh, in your particular case. Well, you know, anti anti-pharmaceutical uh, could be perhaps more accurately for most of us described as uh, the default position is no thank you. I need to be convinced that this is going to be valuable for me, that the net benefit outweighs the, the, the costs, um, that, that there is net benefit rather. And um, <clears throat> that somehow, that position which is an extraordinarily reasonable and middle of the road position, uh, has been denounced as anti-scientific, as right wing, as uh, as bad for public health, as therefore anti-community spirited, and it is it is none of these things. Elmo and his father, notwithstanding. Right. Now this reminds me of what I was going to say. The. There is a hallmark. In fact, I think there are several hallmarks of corruption. How much of what we think is true about X, Y, or Z vaccine or transfection agent is the result of a corrupt system? Mm -hmm. One of the hallmarks of it is going to be the gap between uh, efficaciousness and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Right Now, the distinction between these things, as you know, is that efficacy is under scientific conditions. It's basically uh, in the lab, right? Or, or during the trials. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and effectiveness is empirically in the world. How well does mm-hmm. it work? So if you After had the a- trials have ended, if it's been stamped by the FDA or whomever, um, and now it's just out being used 
uh, by by gen pop by the general population, then then we are talking effectiveness. Right. Yeah. So there are reasons for these two numbers not to be the same. Right. For mm -hmm. example, the difficulty of, if a protocol is very effective against a disease, but it's very difficult for a person to follow, you may find people not following it very well, and mm -hmm. so the effectiveness will be lower. Yep. Um, on the other hand, that doesn't apply to something like these transfection agents. Nope. Right. The point is it gets administered under the uh, eyes of an expert by an expert and it has its effect or it doesn't. And that's not. Well, I mean, actually, there is actually one uh, one thing that we know of. Aspiration. Uh, it, right. Uh, wherein uh, presumably, although who knows, but in the trials, you had people giving the shots who actually had been trained for the five minutes they needed to be trained in how to actually give a shot, which included uh, aspiration of yeah. Well, that'd be fascinating if uh, they had been trained to do it. And then we, we, there is now ample anecdotal evidence uh, that some number of people uh, who seem to have, who now be downstream of vaccine injuries, COVID vaccine injuries, uh, had people delivering the shots who did not know to, what is it, aspirate the needle? I'm not actually sure the grammatical way to say it. Uh, aspirate the syringe. Yeah. Um, so the reason that this matters is because in general, if you put the needle in an arbitrary distance, you don't hit a blood vessel. And so whatever you're injecting goes into the, the lymph space essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore it has time to infect, you know, if it's a if it's a vaccine, it has time to infect the cells right there so it doesn't just float around the body and infect cells randomly. And frankly, making your arm sick is better than making your lungs sick, for example. Right. Um, so it matters a lot. So if they trained people in the trials mm -hmm. to do this correctly, so the idea is if you happen to hit a blood vessel and you inject the thing, so the thing is circulating now in your blood um, rather than in the interstitial space, um, that's a hazard because right. it's not by design. So You want this to be localized. Right. So if they trained people, if they understood that this needed to be done correctly, in the trial in order to reduce the number of adverse events. In order for and, it to actually be an effective treatment, right? Efficacious treatment. Well, I mean, <laughs> let's put it this way. There's another weird phenomenon here is that you're talking about a respiratory virus and you're talking about the injection in the arm. And so it's, right. there's a question about whether that made sense in the first place. Right. But, but nonetheless- up the nose might have been a more effective vaccine. Yeah, yeah. we didn't have that vaccine. Yeah. But in any case, the- um, if you've hit a blood vessel and you inject it, that's bad. Teaching people to figure out whether they've hit a blood vessel before they inject the stuff is not difficult. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was not done and is apparently still not being done is insane. Mm -hmm. So that was a very important uh, potential difference here. But in any case, what I wanted to get at is if pharma games its own trials to make things look much more efficacious than they are and much less hazardous than they are, mm -hmm. then what that will look like is a giant gap between what was reported from the trials and what we see out in the wild. And of course, getting rid of your, uh, getting rid of the control group more generally by vaccinating everybody is one way to prevent that from happening. But what we are seeing, I mean, if and you- unblinding the- Unblinding the, the trial so the yeah. actual control group ceases to be yeah. um, and then trying to vaccinate everybody irrespective of whether or not an age stratification makes any argument whatsoever for vaccinating some of them is another good way. And so mm -hmm. what what is all of this? Well, one hallmark of it being about corruption is, oh, they told me this thing was 90 plus percent uh, efficacious and its effectiveness is garbage. Now they're telling me I need one every nine months. Right? They're telling me I need one every nine months and it doesn't prevent transmission or contraction of the virus. So, what is that gap between, oh, these things are stellar and yeah, it's garbage. You're going to need one all the time. Right? <laughs> That's a measure of corruption, as is the um, double standard between the various um, metrics that are that these new agents are exposed to versus existing agents that are repurposed. And we should come back to that another day. But the um, double standard is one hallmark of corruption and a vast gap between efficaciousness and effectiveness, right? These two technically different things is going to be another one. Mm -hmm.